Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Series presented by ProScan MRI Education Foundation. And this vignette is going to help us finalize and bring together the last anatomic syndromes of the anterior inferior labrum in macro instability. Let's get to it right away. And we're going to cover, as we said, both anterior and inferior syndromes. So as a quick review, we have the Hagel lesion the humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. Here is the inferior glenohumeral ligament, and there is the injury in orange from the humeral neck, the humeral avulsion. Then we have the b or bagel, avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament from the humeral neck with a piece of bone, thus the term B for bone. Then the floating IGHL, also known as the IGL, the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament injury, where both sides are affected, the labrum and the capsule on the glenoid side and the capsule on the humeral side. Then the raggle, the reverse haggle, a tear or injury of the posterior aspect of the humeral insertion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Then the one we'll talk about today, the gaggle. This one's a bit tricky. The glenoid side of the inferior glenohumeral ligament is injured or torn, yet the labrum is preserved, although may be a bit edematous. Then we have the inferior alpsa, which you've heard about previously. The anterior labroligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion, where the labrum comes off, medializes, and slides underneath the stripped periosteum. Then some simple ones, where we have a direct vertical tear the inferior capsule. A sprain where things stretch out. They may thicken. They may even thicken and contract and produce scar tissue to create a pseudomass. Look to the right and you'll see a gaggle-like lesion. Preservation of the neck attachment of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. But as we move over to the glenoid side, there is detachment with one caveat. The labrum is also involved. The labrum is ever so slightly separated from the adjacent cartilage, making it a gaggle-like lesion. But remember, in a gaggle, the labrum is allowed to swell, but it shouldn't displace. Here's a true gaggle with the accompanying diagram. The labrum in its perfect position. The hyaline labral interface, undisturbed, as in the prior case. Here is the labrum, very swollen and gray, but in the proper relationship with the cortex and adjacent hyaline cartilage. The capsule is distended inferiorly. And right there corresponds to the tear of the glenoid side of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. The patient also has a nasty hill sacs fracture that is V-shaped like a tomahawk chop with associated osteoedema. Here's the rest of our gaggle seen on a T1-weighted image. Our ruptured glenoid portion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, our labrum, which is hemorrhaged and enlarged, seen better on the water-weighted sequence in its appropriate position with appropriate relationship to the glenoid, distension of the capsule, and tear of the glenoid portion of the inferior capsule. And once again, our nasty hill sacs lesion seen as a defect in the suprolateral humerus. Here's another gaggle-like lesion. This one is a vulst from the glenoid, but unfortunately the labrum has also come off from its normal position, which should attempt to hug the ball of the humerus. In this case, the inferior labrum is displaced medially under the capsule and under this tissue the periosteum. So this qualifies this lesion as something other than a gaggle. It looks more like an alpsa lesion, an anterior inferior labroligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion. Then we have the glom lesion. My father used to call people on the highway a glom when he was driving his truck. But a fight never ensued because the other person never knew what a glom was. But I assume it had a negative connotation. It has a negative connotation on MR as well. It stands for a glenolabral ovoid mass. The mass consisting of 
the labral tissue surrounded by capsule and adjacent to this one, some frayed round capsule as well. The diagram also shows the labrum in yellow and the surrounding capsule wrapped around it in a ball. This is a typical lesion seen in violent dislocations and is rather complex. Frequently, the glenohumeral ligaments, like the middle glenohumeral ligament, are also affected. The drive-through sign, described by Pagnani and Warren. This is an arthroscopic sign where the scope is placed through the shoulder from the back and is pressed against the anterior capsule. The capsule feels too elastic, like a trampoline. The same findings can be seen on MRI, where redundancy of the anterior capsule is apparent. It looks a little bit like a corkscrew, the MR equivalent of the drive-through sign. This patient also had a posterior inferior injury that made the abnormality more complex. But the drive-through sign is illustrated on the upper image, an axial T1 spin echo in a patient that also had an eigel. Sprains and injuries of the inferior capsule are a pretty simple concept to comprehend. You can have a vertical tear through the inferior capsule. There's the inferior capsule without a vertical tear, but it is stretched out. This happens commonly with antero-inferior dislocations. Sometimes with persistent stretching, the capsule will thicken and scar, and eventually it will contract back. That's what you see in the lower left-hand corner. Contraction of the capsule into the labrum, producing an inferior labro ligamentous inflamed pseudomass. Then finally, the elusive ellipsa. We have the alpsa, but what's an ellipsa? An ellipsa is an anterior labrum intact periosteal sleeve avulsion. In other words, the anterior labrum remains intact, but the periosteal sleeve is affected. There is your labrum, a bit diminutive but present, your thickened middle glenohumeral ligament, the distended capsule with a synechiae inside, and the elevated periosteum with a triangular area of edema and hemorrhage that corresponds beautifully to the accompanying diagram. So in summary, an ellipsa is a periosteal injury that is more medial in position with preservation of the labrum. Well, that concludes our discussion of some of the more unusual anterior labro-ligamentous injuries. The surgery and treatment for these depends upon the syndrome, the severity of the syndrome, the accompanying other abnormalities, and especially what the individual has to do, what their activity is. Do they have to use their arm to push straight away, or do they have to use the arm in a 360 or 270 degree motion? Thank you.